welcome back to another week of Art Life. In this week's episode, I'm going to set myself a painting challenge. I'm Jessie. I've been a full-time artist for 10 years and thought it about time I start sharing my painting techniques and adventures. Subscribe to join me every week for a window into my art life. So the idea uh, for this week's episode came about from a book I'm currently reading called The Book of Legendary Lands by Umberto Eco. Um, it's basically a utopian dystopian exploration of landscapes which is almost beyond um, our imagination um, or limited imagination. Uh, it focuses on epic poems of Homer to contemporary science fiction, holy scriptures to modern mythology and fairy tale. Basically, um, Echo finds these incredible images of landscapes, uh, extracts from ancient books, Renaissance paintings, lands of seven wonders, anything remotely mystical um, and slightly incredible uh, with landscape can be found in this book. And on page 67, there was a reference to an artist called Arnold Bocklin. Um, and for this piece, it was just looking at the way the artist uh, studies in his Swiss symbolist way, a study of landscape form uh, and the imaginary other worldly landscape and it got me thinking about Bocklin and the Isle of the Dead and I thought well for art life this week why don't I set myself the challenge of trying to paint a transcription of this painting and also do a little bit more research into the history behind it and see if I can dissect why I'm so obsessed with this particular painting. So Arnold Bocklin was born in 1827 and he died in 1901. Um, he is most well known as a Swiss symbolist painter um, but also was also known for his atmospheric compositions. So his most famous painting is the Isle of the Dead. Um, I'm sure you might know about it and if you don't you're about to. Um, he painted five versions of this painting. Um, what was so interesting is that each version was subtly slightly different and when you think about uh, how people are inspired by different paintings of this uh, series, uh, Rachmaninoff had apparently seen the black and white version of this painting and created an entire piece of music, um, which you can check out on the link below, uh, just for this kind of monochrome painting. Um, I'm going to be looking at the 1880 version, the um, basil version. It's very similar to the New York version. Um, Again, I think it's just a subtle change in maybe the skyline, the detailing. I like the more primitive lapis lazuli, raw sienna, raw umber tones of the uh, 1880 version. And they are his earlier versions of the painting. As he was refining it, it was getting slightly more elaborate and rich and complicated. There's something about the kind of early stages of this painting and its journey with Bocklin that I think just appealed to me um, as an artist. It's sometimes those early moments on a new project which you usually capture something really authentic before you start to over plan it and overwork it in your head. Um, so it depicts a desolate rocky isle. It has so much atmosphere but Again, it is his most pictorially famous painting. At the time in the 19th century, reproductions of images were becoming quite popular. So this image was kind of very commonly associated with Bocklin's work. Um, it has these gorgeous cypress trees in the center of the composition. The, the boat, which uh, is facing the wrong way actually for the direction it's going, um, it does inspire that funerary theme. You have the white shrouded figure um, with a kind of coffin in front of it. It does feel slightly like it's associated with Greek mythology. Maybe the oarsman is uh, Charon and it's the Styx rather than some Acheron. I think there's something about the stillness of the water. It hardly ripples as this boat glides into the Isle of the Dead, which makes me feel like it is transitioning into another dimension, maybe another place which is purely imaginary. Now, Bocklin never actually dissected this painting publicly. He left it to our imaginations. He was known for saying it must be a dream picture and it must produce such stillness that one would be awed by a knock at the door. I definitely feel this. The more I look at this painting, the more it kind of pulls me in uh, to that kind of the darker recesses within those cypress trees. Um, there's something ancient and timeless about it, the kind of structures um, kind of carved into the stonework of the island. It could be modelled on an island maybe around Crete, although Bocklin um, 
had 14 children, eight of which died, and one of his younger daughters uh, was buried in the Florence English Cemetery near his painting studio in Florence uh, at the time, um, which is very, very sad, but some of the structures might may maybe be seen as like echoes of, um, you know, with the mausoleums uh, to some of the structures in the painting. Maybe it was kind of loosely in the undertones of why he wanted to paint something like this. I think it's a subject which most artists are either morbidly fascinated by or don't really want to talk about, um, you know, death. Um, I probably should have gone into it more at Halloween or something, but I think it's a subject that is very much in art, memento mori, everything must die, everything organic, particularly in landscape, it's about cycles. At the moment we're edging into winter, which means that we're losing all the life that we've been enjoying over the sort of summer and the brilliant show of autumn. And now we're going into a quieter time of year. So it's actually a really good time of year to talk about this painting because it is about timelessness. It's about going within, but also about contemplation, the atmosphere, can be seen as slightly morose and solitary, uh, but for me there's something restful about it. It does feel inevitable somehow, and in this structure it feels like it exists in another space, and that's what's so interesting about Bockling's composition. There is symmetry, but it's slightly disaligned. The trees aren't perfectly central. The way the sort of whiteness of the structure, uh, the figures, some of the tones of almost maybe like marble or, or the kind of lighter surface it catches the light it, it sort of feels like the island has its own light it, its own luminescence and i love that feeling that it kind of embodies an otherworldliness and elemental style of painting atmosphere which is something i'm really interested in at the moment so maybe thinking in this challenge that i can learn something from bocklin and trying to attempt to copy this composition um might be a good thing to do today and it's not just me who is attempting to transcribe Bocklin's Isle of the Dead. Famously, Salvador Dali in 1932 did his own transcription titled the pa A True Painting of the Isle of the Dead by Arnold Bocklin at the Hour of Angelus. Um, also, a well-known piece I sort of knew about before I was doing this research was Fabrizio Clerici's study in 1979, which was Latitude de Bocklin. Um, it was, I think, the structure, the way he inclu included the painting, but destructuralized the space as well. And the, the way it engages the viewer into the composition, into entering another space, which is slightly otherworldly, um, I just find really interesting. And maybe I could incorporate it into my own practice a little bit more. H.R. Geiger did a homage of Bocklin in 1977, which was just a few years before um, Clerici's study. So I think the 70s must have had quite a revival for Bocklin's work. Um, but not just in painting, in music, in film. There are so many studies and references to this Isle of the Dead, this concept of this space we journey to in a contemporary way. It's like bringing that classical idea of journeying on a boat, the boatman taking you to your final destination, um, you know, into modern contemporary art, music, literature. Um, so I will link all the links below of references uh, and kind of evidence I found that Bocklin's painting has influenced many more artists um, than just myself today. Most importantly, I'm interested in world building, not just creating a figurative landscape, but an atmosphere which a viewer can get absorbed in and lose themselves in slightly, particularly with Bocklin's study of silence and stillness. Maybe that's something I could incorporate into my own body of work at the moment as well. Um, so I think that's enough talking. I think we should get started. Um, I'll set up the time lapse and we'll see how this challenge, my first challenge on Art Life goes. And if it goes well, maybe I will incorporate more challenges in future episodes.
that is as much as I can do um, while the paint is so wet. I just thought I'd share my palette a little bit with you as well. Um, I probably mixed more colours than I needed, I think, because Bocklin was obviously working um, on it, not on paper, he could work a lot more in depth into his, his work. Um, so I had to be quite careful with these colours so I wouldn't kind of overwork it and make it all grey and sludgy. But yes, this is my final attempt. actually it was quite meditative when I was doing it um, again I listed the colors uh, that of my palette which I was using below just because it's something I've always done with my exercises and I find quite helpful if I leave it for a while and want to go back to it if there's ever a color I can't remember how I made um, it's just kind of good record keeping really um, I think the hardest thing about this painting was probably the nuance of the stone. Um, I love doing that lovely cypress tree block, the darkness in the middle, and then the kind of beautiful lapis sky it was so easy to do. I'm going to probably work a little bit more into the water. I slightly um, ran out of time with the kind of study of the way the light hits the sort of water and how you get the reflection of the rocks underneath. So I'll definitely work back into that when this is dry in a few days. Um, but not a bad first attempt. I can highly recommend transcribing paintings which obsess you slightly. It helps you to understand what it is about the composition that moves you so much. And um, sometimes it's nice not to, just to know something's amazing and leave it at that. But for this piece, I think it's kind of letting me know that I need to start to bring in more structure into my painting. I hate drawing straight lines. I hate drawing boats. I couldn't draw that boat, so I hope you didn't look too closely at that. Um, I need to get better at that. Maybe that's going to be my next challenge, learn how to draw a boat. Um, but I really enjoyed it and I hope you did too. So um, yes, like and subscribe. Please follow me on Instagram at JessOliverArt um, if you can, because I can share lots of things with you. Maybe if you're doing your own transcription, Send me a photo, I would love to see. Um, and leave a comment below if there's anything you'd like to share about this week's episode. Um, and until then, I'm gonna carry on working on this little painting uh, and I will see you next Monday. Don't forget to tune in. Okay, bye guys. <laughs>